so just a quick review. So we started, uh, we started uh, mass transport, or what we refer to as diffusion. And just like before, we are going to go through the same motion, if you will. First, we explain some molecular basis for the transport coefficients that we use. After that, we simply assume that we have those transport coefficients. Typically, they're measured more often than not because whatever theoretical uh, foundation you can get, uh, get for these uh, coefficients, those theoretical explanations are typically there for ideal fluids, kinetic theory, so forth, that are somewhat limiting. So for anything realistic and in petroleum, Engineering, we certainly deal with realistic fluids that are as complex as they get. Uh, basically, it's better to go with experimental measurements if you have any. Then, we will, in terms of uh, solution, you can either work on steady state problems or transient problems. For transient problems, we will use equation of change. That's something that we're going to derive today. And Shell balances if you have steady state problems. Now, shell balances are essentially balance over a little shell is what you use to get equations of change as well. It's just in the equations of change, you're going to have the transient component, the time component, and in steady state balances, you will not. Okay? So that's essentially the difference. Um, I will not have the time to go through the scalar dispersion. Technically, it's on your a list of topics for the qualifying. Practically, I haven't seen it on qualifying in a long time. So, yeah, up to you. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> Technically, you have to stick to the list. But anyway, so let's uh, just quickly review some, uh, some definitions. So we used, we used to, we're used to looking at the phase for heat transfer to momentum, tra momentum transfer. We, we looked at a phase, for instance, brine. Now we are actually going to look inside that phase and look at the individual species of that, uh, within that phase. And because of the different, possibly different concentrations of different species in different regions of the fluid, so I have gradient in concentration, that might induce motion of individual molecules within the phase. And this is what we refer to as diffusion. In order to track it down, I now actually have to look at the mass concentration, which is basically mass of that species A that I looked at divided by volume. So it's sort of like a partial uh, density, if you will. Okay. So this is what I'm going to refer to rho A, rho B, or whatever notation we look into. Most often we will look at the binary mixtures where I'm tracking my species A, and B really is everything else. It's not that I only have two species most of the time, but I'm interested in one and everything else is labeled as B. So my mass fraction, this is something that we will compute with most often, is just a normalized mass concentration. So I'm going to just divide rho A by rho, which is basically uh, my phase. So if I just looked at that brine and its density, that would be density of the brine. And this would be whatever ion that I'm, A would be whatever ion that I'm tracking within the black brine, for instance, Na plus, okay? So one thing that we always use to help with calculation is that when you look at the mass fractions, however many species you might have, their sum is always one. We can do both with mass concentration and molar concentration, different problems are given different boundary conditions, so that, that's basically what decides which way you're going to go. So if you just look at the molar concentration, you look at the number of moles, this is Na with the subscript A, it's a little typo, Na over V, that I'm going to refer to as Ca. And again, when I look at the C, is, which is the molar concentration for my overall phase, it's sum of all of the individual species within. Okay. And I'm going to look at really or compute for fractions most of the time in these problems. So either mass fraction or molar fraction. Xa is my molar fraction. It's Ca over C. So then sum of all of the individual molar fractions is always 1. So this is just to um, 
review quickly the notation. And then I can look also at the velocity of species A versus velocity of the entire phase. So my VA is velocity of species A. So I basically do the average of all the mole A molecules in my volume. And I look at the mass average velocity, which is my velocity of the phase as we know it. So that's basically, you take the fraction times VA, so it's sort of like a sum of all of the individual components with appropriate fraction multiplying each velocity, individual velocity. And then we can do the same for mole average velocity. They're slightly different, and also we know that mass is conserved, but molar, just the count or number of moles is not necessarily conserved. So that basically causes differences between the two. They could sli be slightly different. Okay? And our equivalent of our laws that we had in this class, so Newton's law, for instance, for diffusion is called Fick's law. And again, the, similar, the simplest of the laws, and those that are used in the practice the most, are those that relate my flux and the gradient that is driving the whole movement in a linear way. Okay? So my flux, which here I'm referring to as Ja, is related in a linear fashion to the gradient in my concentration. Okay? So basically, and I have, I'm scaling this time with rho, which is my entire mass density, and this coefficient here is diffusivity. It's the A diffusing with respect to all other molecules of B. And we already learned that DAB is the same as DBA. Okay. Now, one thing to remember is that this JA that Fick's law is talking about is relative to the motion of the entire phase. So it's really isolating just that part of the motion that is due to the concentration difference only, regardless of the movement of the phase as a whole. Okay. So for movement that is taking everything into account, we will look at the combined mass flux, and that's actually the topic of the day later. So basically, my combined mass flux is actually this JAVA, but I'm going to subtract sort of or, or the motion relative to the phase, entire phase motion, and that is my uh, flux as a, uh, based on just diffusion, and that's what's governed by Fick's law. So, uh, and we already noticed that dBA is the same as dAB. Okay, uh, some example values, and then we looked into, okay, well, what is dAB? Let me get some feeling for it and what governs it from the molecular perspective. And we started... I think we just derived it last time. So basically, we use the same kinetic theory that we are already very familiar with, which is bouncing. I call it bouncing tennis balls. Okay, <laughs> have low density, um, low density gas, and any collisions that I might have with, uh, between the molecules are elastic, okay? and there are no other forces at play. Which we know it's not true for any more complex mo molecules. We're going to have some attractive forces between them. But for the simplest derivation, just to get the feel for it, kinetic theory is enough. So these are all the familiar formulas that we used from kinetic theory. And just like before, we will impose the concentration gradient. Okay? And we will assume that it's linear over this averaged length. So A and lambda are my statistical averages. So I should have enough molecules for this averaging to work and to have a nice linear profile. So I'm having different concentration at different distances. And I, when I use the Taylor's expansion chopped with all of the second order terms chopped off, so I just have the first two terms, then when I calculate mass flux across a plane that is at the position y is equal to a, I have to look at all of the molecules, and I statistically have a number of them that are going to bump into that plane, that is that z. Okay? I look at, literally count up all of them coming in one direction, and I subtract those who are kind of a little lost and didn't hear about this imposed gradient, and they go down anyway. Okay? So some of those molecules will do that. So when we do that, 
we will actually look at, so this is my number of collisions, and those are literally the mass of uh, each individual molecule A coming from below, and then subtract all of those that are going actually down. So this is the concentration or the uh, characters, uh, characteristics that they carry. So when I put in what my Z is, I will actually note that number of molecules times MA is actually my rho A, and that is by definition rho times omega A. And omega is my fraction, so we're typically calculating in terms of fractions in mass transport. So when I actually do that, so my rho of the entire phase doesn't necessarily change in this case, okay? What's changing is actual individual species concentration within the phase. So rho we are treating as a constant unless we are looking at some major temperature changes um, that would actually have an additional gradient to it, but that's not the case here. So basically, I will look at this is a constant, this is a constant, and when I do the difference between the two, I will have a gradient in concentration show. So when I clean that up, I will see that flux, indeed mass flux, is rho times something that depends only on gas that I'm looking at and no uh, concentration of it. So lambda and u is something that I know from kinetic theory. And then I have the concentration gradient uh, showing up on its own here. So when I compare this to the Fick's law, okay, I will get that basically my DAA is one-third U bar lambda. Okay? And if you throw in all of the, what these two mean, you will get something like this. So we have a Boltzmann constant here, mass of the molecules, diameter of the molecule, and temperature, which is my macroscopic measurement, as well as the entire row, one over row, so the entire density of the entire phase right here. Okay. Great. So how does that now compare with what we had before, all other coefficients? It kind of like looks familiar, right? So we had something similar for viscosity, we had something similar for ther thermal conductivity, and indeed they're all kind of related up to a constant. If you go back to what we had before, there's one-third rho u lambda. So basically, rho times the AA is the same as viscosity. Okay. And then I have thermal conductivity. I don't have just rho, but I also have my heat capacity at constant volume. So everything in some sort of this ideal gas where I have super elastic collisions and nothing else complicates my life. All these transports are really related to each other in terms of coefficients. They're all really just by constants and some microscopic constants such as density okay, of the entire phase. So they kind of scale with each other as I would expect in the simple world of bouncing, super elastically bouncing balls. Okay. In reality, things are a little more complex. Whoops. Don't disconnect. Okay. In reality, we will actually have corrections. So one thing that we need to note is when, we're, when I'm actually looking at how does the AA depend on temperature, what do I have to take into account? So I have square root of T here, but do I conclude then that the AA depends on the square root of T? The density is so I have to look into density. So for instance, here I would use the ideal gas law. So rho is proportional to temperature, right? So that I have to take into account to basically uh, look into that, okay? <coughs> and often they, you will also have that rho times the AA is then just the square root of T. So that's another way to look at it. So, uh, so we already commented on this, how do I uh, scale with the pressure and temperature. So, and uh, we compared these already. So one thing that we have to take into account, and we never derived this before for viscosity, we will not derive it 
uh, here either. But basically, if I, when I was deriving this, I was assuming that all of the molecules have same mass and same diameter. So A is this diffusing within very similar molecules, as described by kinetic theory. So the similarity is basically having the same mass and having the same diameter. That's not super realistic, of course. If I have multiple species, they will have different characteristics. So one correction that is typically used that is based on correlations from experiments is the DAB. So basically, you will take both of the mass of A and B into account and do the different averages, either harmonic or um, here we have DAB plus uh, DB. I don't know what kind of average would this be with a square in there. So, and also, if I actually add intermolecular for forces, then our collision parameter that we know from before and that we look up in the back of the book shows up again. So I have a little more complex relationship here again. So I have dependence of both temperature and pressure right here. Okay. So basically, in order to see Ultimately, and this is how it compares to what we had before for thermal conductivity and viscosity. So I have somewhat similar relationship. One thing that I have to take into account again is that pressure depends on T as well. So when I'm looking into uh, how does the AB ultimately depend on temperature, I do have to look at uh, the fact that P is CRT. Okay, so I have a, essentially 1 over T here in the dependence. Often, we will actually look at the, we will multiply the entire relationship with C, okay, which is my entire uh, molar concentrations, uh, molar concentrations. So basically, C times DAB depends on square root of T as a temperature. Okay. So for constant temperature, I don't, it, expect it to change much. And we will use that a lot in our calculation, okay? When working with either, uh, with either molar expression or mass fraction expressions, we will count on rho times the AB being constant or C times the AB being constant, depending which type of uh, fraction I'm solving for. So I might be solving for mass fraction or I might be solving for molar fraction. What is useful to do is that often at low concentrations and low densities, you're going to use that C times the AB or rho times the AB are constant. Okay. So that's something to remember for future. Okay. And then for liquids, I did not, I skipped discussing liquids back uh, during the viscosity uh, uh, consideration in chapter one. I'm going to do the same again here. There are different theoretical treatments for liquids. One is Iring, one is Nernst Einstein. If you want to learn more, you can look at 17.4 chapter in, uh, in BSL. But ultimately, no theory works really well for liquids because they have very complex intermolecular forces. Okay? So basically, it's extremely hard to account for those for diffusion. So what we will really move on to is both equations of change and shell balances, or rather things that are going to help us sell, solve the problems. So whether or not I get to all of these problems, these are the problems that are highly suggested that you solve uh, from BSL. They're basically very, they're the equivalent of our chapter 10 and our chapter 2 that we had before for heat transport and momentum transport for shell balances. Okay. And what will I do now, I will technically do a shell balance just to derive equations of change that you can use for solving the problems as well. And by now you should have the intuition whether you like shell balances or equations of change better when solving problems. Okay. One problem with equations of change, they just dump the PDE on you, and that doesn't mean that you can necessarily easily, you might get a high order of PDE, right? Uh, in, in this case, mass fraction or molar fraction, okay? 
and the high order PDE might not be as simple to solve. Whereas when you're doing shell balances, you're doing things like sort of layer by layer, if you will. Okay? And that allows you to possibly solve that PDE better or to see what to uh, do to actually solve it. So it's up to you what you find uh, is easier. But again, you will see a lot of similarity to what we did before. OK, so I will move on to writing. So let's actually do our fundamental shell balance to derive equations of change. So the title is macroscopic equations of change for multi component, oops, I don't know how to write today, system. And this is chapter 19.1 in BSL. So just as we always do, we will actually look at a simple shell in Cartesian coordinate system. The ultimate equations that we get in the vector form will be true regardless of the coordinate system. And this is from x plus x plus delta x. So this is delta x, delta y, and delta z. Okay. And then in z, of course, I go from z to z plus delta z. And y, y plus delta y in y. So as always, I will go through the boundaries of my little shell and look what's coming in and out through the boundaries. And I say through the boundaries, in order for anything to go in and out, it has to go normal to the boundary. Right? Now, what is the flux that I'm going to look into? If I just look, so basically let's say that I'm looking at these two faces. Okay. So this is my x direction. I'm going to, of course, look at the things that are going strictly normal to the boundary. So whatever flux that I'm going to look at, into, I have to do a dot product with this normals to the side. And then I just have to define, uh, we haven't actually mentioned, how am I going to call, uh, call the combined flux? all my species A, or more generally, I could have not just species A and B, I could have N species, okay? And I'm going to refer to them as numbers alpha, one through N. So just a more general situation is I'm going to have row A 
my row A uh, will become row alpha, and alpha is any one out of n species. So we're going more general. But just like before, my rho alpha is mass of species alpha within my volume. So nothing else really changes other than more general notation. So this is species, so alpha is the component number or label. So this is my mass concentration. Of course, I'm going to analog, uh, in analogous way, I'm going to have my fraction of component alpha also equivalent is C alpha and X alpha for my molar concentrations and molar fraction. Okay. So same as before. And of course, sum of all of the alphas is going to be my phase density, right? And if I'm looking at sum of all of the fractions, that sum is going to be 1. And similar is true for C alphas and X alphas, right? Now, when I'm, I'm going to label combined flux, okay? So J alpha was our fixed law flux, which didn't ho have any convective con component. When I add convective component to J alpha, I'm going to call that combined flux. So that's my total flux okay, that I actually see. So I'm going to refer to that as N alpha. Okay? So this is my combined mass flux, actually. So that's basically my diffusion only plus convection. So in terms of convection, how do I have species alpha coming into my volume? With what velocity? V average. V average, so my entire phase velocity. And what's coming in is rho A or rho alpha. I'm now make, I'm going to keep mixing alpha and A. And because of the definition of J alpha that was taken as relative, we call that this is just rho A V A. Okay. So then you would get that your J alpha is rho A V A minus rho A V, which was relative to the entire mass of the entire phase. So the way we define J alpha, J alpha by definition was rho A VA relative to the velocity of entire phase. So this is basically what I'm referring to as NA. Okay? We just didn't call it that way immediately. So my diffusion only was combined minus convective component. Okay? <coughs> so just to, so this is combined. This is diffusion only, and this is convection. This is simply what walks into my volume because I'm not moving with the volume. I have a static coordinate system. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm going to keep mixing A because I started already thinking how I define things before. 
I'm going to keep mixing things. And similarly, we are going to have molar flux, so combined molar flux. And I'm just going to use uppercase. So same thing, J alpha plus rho, uh, not rho, C A, C alpha V star. And that is the same as C alpha V alpha star. And for just to be general enough, uh, I'm going to call R alpha is rate of production of species alpha so that rate is typical typically kilogram in meter cube second and of course it's molar equivalent will be r alpha so that's moles per meter cube second all right so now we have labels out of the way <laughs> so we can actually do the mass balance so what is coming through, or rate of my component alpha, coming through this boundary at x? Everything that is coming in. Which flux I'm going to use? Combined flux, right? So combined flux, and I have to do a dot product with this which is, this is actually delta x here, right? Yes? So what's coming in is n alpha dot uh, rho x. Okay. Evaluated at x, which is the same as simply x component of my vector. evaluated at x, and that is rate of addition of alpha through phase x. So diffusion and convection combined. What is going going out in x direction through this phase? Okay, so what's coming out out will be simply n alpha x evaluated x plus delta x. So rate it's not of addition but removal of alpha through phase x plus delta x. And again, diffusion and convection combined. Convection combined. So to actually get the entire, so this is the rate to get the entire stuff, the, or the entire amount coming in versus amount coming out, I have to multiply this rate by area. So now we're actually ready to set Set the balance okay so when I actually put n alpha x evaluated by x so that is my addition minus removal times area of the face is the face x or face x plus delta x, delta, right? 
So that is my X faces. Now I just do the similar thing for my Y faces and Z faces, right? So I'm going to have plus and alpha Y, Y, Y at Y plus delta Y. What is area of the Y face? And then the similar for Z. And area of Z face is? Okay. So when I combine all of this, and then I also add any rate of production, or maybe removal as well, inside, so that's going to be my rate is R alpha times the volume. What is this equal to? So either accumulation or maybe removal inside my volume. If I have steady state, it's going to be equal to zero, which is what we refer to as shell balance for steady state problems. Right? But if it's not zero, then it's simply equal to change in time Okay, times volume. So this is rate of accumulation or rate of increase or decrease of mass of alpha within control volume. And it's, of course, zero for steady state balance. All right. What is the next step? What do we always do? Divide by volume and shrink my control volume to a point to actually get a partial differential equation. So we do that. And shrink volume. So I'm going to get that d rho alpha dt is equal to, can we already see what's coming up? What am I going to get out of the first term? Negative x derivative of x component of an alpha, right? What's going to be of the, sec of the second term? What's going to come of that? Negative y derivative of y component okay, of an alpha. And then I'm going to have negative z derivative of z component. So what is our favorite operator in this course? Divergence. Divergence, of course. So basically, I'm going to have here divergence of n alpha because divergence of a vector is ddx of the x component plus ddy of the y component plus ddz of a z component, right? And r alpha just remains r alpha. And this is true for all of my components. Does this remind you of anything? The equation that we had before? What did I have for mass before doing our momentum balance? Equation of? Continuity. You think the equation of continuity is still valid? Should be. <laughs> so this is individual component. So this is essentially equation of con continuity. For single component.
Now let's actually take this apart a little, so before we put it back together. So how will I actually put it back together? So my equation of continuity was talking about rho, which is density of the entire phase. Okay? And rho alpha are my partial densities of different components. So when I add them all up together, I'm going to get rho. Okay? So we're going to actually add them all up together and see what we get. And we better get the equation of <laughs> continuity, otherwise we did something terribly wrong in this, uh, in this uh, derivation. And we're going to do that for a second. Let's just actually see all of the individual components here. So I know that my n alpha, okay, it has j alpha in there, which is my fixed law. So it has diffusion and convection, and then I have this production term separately. So this is really j alpha, divergence of j alpha minus divergence of rho alpha v. So this is when I break down what n alpha means, n plus r alpha. So this is diffusion. This is convection. And this is production. So my equation of continuity was talking about convection only. Okay, there was no diffusion in there. So essentially when I sum all of this up, this diffusion part should disappear. Okay? Should it? Well, we had that JA I derived last time, that JA plus JB was zero, right? And if I extend this to n species, sum of all of the individual J's is zero because they're defined relative to alpha. So essentially, when I sum over all of this up, so do a sum, Of over alpha. So when I sum them up, I'm going to get that d rho dt, which is, by the way, sum of alpha 1 through n, d rho alpha dt, is equal to minus sum of all of the j's, which is the same. Uh, I'm going to immediately actually write down that this is equal to So it's sum of divergences. Sum and divergence can switch places. And this, we remember, is zero by definition of my molecular mass fluxes. And then minus divergence of and sum of all of the R alphas. What is this equal to? Rho. Rho? And this? Hopefully zero. <laughs> it is. <laughs> My logic tells me it should be zero. It is. So that's basically mass conservation of species. So by mass, if I produce a mass of something else, I'm going to take it from somewhere else, right? So mass remains conserved. So this is indeed zero. So this is total, total mass conservation. Uh, in reactions. So again, for a number of moles, that's not necessarily the true. But for mass, it is. So indeed, I get that d rho 
dt is equal to minus dot product of rho. Yes? Good. So this is my equation of continuity. Continuity for the entire mixture as we know it. Okay. So now I'm just going to state the equivalent equations for the equivalent uh, equation for my molar quantities. So I'm going to call that molar quantity equivalence one thing that I'm the way I'm gonna go back and forth or it's useful to go back and forth is that my rho alpha is C alpha times M alpha so it's basically my molar fraction times molar mass of the component So my N alpha is also M alpha, N alpha. So the rest of it, this is basically what you now plug into the equations that I had so far. So I'm just going to state the equations, the equivalent of equations. So my equ equation of continuity equivalent is partial C alpha, whoops, C. C alpha partial T is... R alpha and when I actually do the summation of this I'm going to get something like partial C partial T is minus dot C V star but this does not go away okay? because number of moles is not conserved during reactions. Okay. okay. After this, we are basically going to start, I'm going to state some uh, special cases that are most useful for solving problems, and then we're going to go to solving problems. So uh, that's something that we're going to continue on Wednesday. Mm -hmm.